Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and ending corporate domination. Our guest today is Chuck Johnson, director of the Joint Task Force on Nuclear Power of the Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. He's been our guest once or twice, or maybe even three times before, <laughs> and so it's good to have you back. Oh, it's great to be back. Great, Thanks. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we want to talk about uh, small nuclear reactors, mm. uh, small module reactors, because they're not really that they're trying to hide them. Mm, uh, and mm -hmm. not actually call them nuclear. But first of all, why, why don't you talk a little bit about the dangers of nuclear energy, nuclear power? Okay, well, um, the there are two main uh, reasons why nuclear power is, is something that we oppose in terms of both safety and the long-term health consequences. And uh, one is the potential for a large-scale accident, as we've seen in a couple of cases. Uh, at Fukushima and also at Chernobyl and uh, a large accident that wasn't as serious but still was quite serious at Three Mile Island here in the United States. And the, the, the problem is that nuclear power has to work well 100% of the time. As uh, nuclear engineer Arne Gunderson, who's become a nuclear critic, likes to say, you can have 30 good years with nuclear power and then one bad day. And that one bad day can release uh, hundreds of dangerous radionuclides into the environment um, around the facility. And so far, we haven't even really had uh, what could be a worst case accident um, with, um, with nuclear power. The Chernobyl accident released a core's worth of material, um, which is bad. And the uh, Fukushima accident released uh, several cores worth of material, uh, which is also bad. But um, an a even greater danger is the spent nuclear fuel that's stored next to these reactors. Um, if we had an accident that, um, that released that material, you could have several cores worth of radioactive material released into the environment, which would be the worst case scenario for a nuclear accident. Um, the other danger that we see as being really significant is the long-term uh, storage of that waste um, because it remains intensely physically and radioactively hot for a very long time. To give a, an illustration, um, exposure to a single uh, fuel assembly, of which there are hundreds in, in a nuclear power plant, uh, for uh, seven seconds after a year of, of uh, removal from a reactor would give a worker a fatal dose. Uh, seven seconds. Seven seconds. Wow. Uh, it, it, after 10 years, that's increased to a little over a minute. But that's 10 years later. You think oh, something would cool down within 10 years. Yes, mm -hmm. it has cooled down, but it's still intensely hot. Mm -hmm. uh, even after 100 years, that same fuel assembly would uh, give a worker a fatal dose uh, in a little over 12 minutes. So even 100 years later, mm -hmm. working around unshielded high-level radioactive waste is extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a reactor would have, have uh, did you call them rods? Well, I call it an assembly, an which, assembly. In, which contains uh, a, n a number of fuel rods. Okay, and so uh, how many assemblies in, in a in You know, a plant? it's funny, it depends on the reactor design, but um, uh, it's it's in the it's it's a couple hundred, basically. Okay. Right. Okay. And, and, and so there's assemblies which are in the plant, and there's assemblies which are no longer in the plant because they have uh, what use their. Uh, they've used their capacity to to generate electricity in the in the types of reactors that we've been using, and what happens is, you you uh, when you're creating these fuel rods in the first place, you're using. Um, uh, a couple of isotopes of uranium, uh, the the fuel pellets that are part of, that are put inside of these rods, uh, uh, are the end of, end product of a process of mining uranium, milling it, and then increasing the uh, amount of the more reactive form of of uh, uranium to a higher level, so that you'll have a, a more consistent reaction inside of your reactor. And then once it once it's been enriched to that level, 
Uh, then this fuel is put into the fuel rods and put inside of the reactor. And then uh, in a controlled way, uh, they remove the control rods and, uh, and this, the reaction starts. Um, after, initially it was three years, now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States is allowing uh, reactor operators to run, to use the same fuel for six years. Um, and at that point, the fuel becomes physically hot, as I was saying before, and uh, full of hundreds of radioactive isotopes that make it more difficult for the reaction to occur in a controlled way. So they have to be taken out of the, out of the uh, reactor. It's all done underwater with uh, lifts and the shielded by water. Water is a very good shield for radioactivity and moved into a watery spent fuel pool where they, they sit and cool then for a number of years. Uh, used to be that they recommended about five years and now they're because they're allowing these reactors to, to run the same fuel for six years and it comes out hotter and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is beginning to look at what that means and uh, it looks as though they're going to recommend that that, that uh, spent fuel stay in in the spent fuel pools for maybe 10 or 12 years instead mm. of the five that they were previously oh, yeah. recommending. So, so after they're ready to come out of the uh, out of the pool, what happens to them? Well, they're put into what are called dry casks, um, and again, this is all done under water to shield the, the workers, and um, it's a it's a metal sheath that's then further surrounded by concrete to. Uh, protect uh, people from the radiation. It has vents uh, for heat, but not vents for, you know, any radioactive materials. And, and air is circulated around these, uh, these dry casks uh, using convection, so it doesn't involve mm -hmm. using um, any electricity to pump the air around it. They're, they're sealed inside with, with helium uh, inside the, the inner uh, um, cask, dry cask, and uh, and then the uh, air is circulated inside of the concrete hmm. overpack to keep it cool. Okay. Still intensely hot. Uh, it yeah. was, we there's fascinating footage of uh, the um, spent fuel that's sitting in dry casks at the Trojan nuclear plant uh, site, which is uh, was Oregon's only nuclear power plant, uh, but was decommissioned in. Uh, it was shut down permanently in 1993 and the decommissioning was finished about, I think about uh, 14 years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and this waste has been sitting on the pad there and, and KOIN TV went there, did a story on it and had some wonderful, interesting footage showing this heat just radiating out of, coming out, oh, out really? of the uh, little vents uh -huh. at the top of the, uh, you know, still uh -huh. after this reactor has been shut since 1993, and wow. here we are in 20. Yeah, yeah. It was last year, 2016. Yeah. And, and these uh, casts are, are they what would be taken to a permanent disposal site? Well, that's if, if we had one. They're trying to figure that out. They, they the casts come in many forms, and they have a d bunch of different companies building them, and they're built to different specifications, and they all have to get licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And some of them are rated for, tr for transport, and some of them aren't. Uh -huh. um, and uh, one of the things they're trying to figure out right now is with this, what they call high burn-up fuel, the fuel that's been kept in the reactor for six years instead of the three, uh, whether it is more likely to degrade inside the dry casks, that is to say, the zirconium sheath on the fuel rods uh, breaks apart and then you have fuel uh, collecting at the bottom of, of the cask. Um, they call that f uh, fuel failure. Hmm. And uh, when you have fuel failure, then you, you would have to have an even more robust cask to make sure that, that you wouldn't uh, have it come out. Or you might have to repack it entirely because uh, there's potential if you had enough fuel collect at the bottom that you could have uh, either hydrogen formed or, or um, explosions. Uh, you know, you got criticality explosions even inside of a dry cask potentially. Right. And, and so, <laughs> so if there were a national disposal site, then they would be taking these on trucks across the nation on, on the freeways and 
trucks okay. and rail. Uh -huh. Yeah, and Trojans waste would have to come through Portland. Uh -huh. um, you okay. know, uh, there this really should, isn't any other should, way for yeah. it to, <laughs> this to should get out. Raise of that. a bunch of red flags. <laughs> I would hope with people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, let's talk about these new small reactors, small module reactors. What are they? How are they different than a standard plant? Um, well, they're similar in one way in that they're a light water reactor, which is the same basic reactor design that we've been using, uh, that with the, the Navy selected as its reactor design for propulsion of naval vessels, and then was used in commercial nuclear power. Um, and the reason that they chose to do that instead of some other design, because there's been a number of designs that have been tried and looked at over the years, uh, is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is more uh, familiar with light water reactors and is more likely to license this new small modular reactor system more quickly if it's a light water system that they're already familiar with. So that's, that's the primary reason that the New Scale Corporation, uh, which is a spin-off company from uh, an Oregon State University research project, project done by a, a professor there, Dr. Jose Reyes, into designing a new uh, reactor system that, that he believes is safer and that they can produce in a way that economically makes sense. And they're putting it forth as a alternative to uh, fossil fuels in a way to, for us to deal with our climate problems. So uh, as, a, as a clean energy fuel, renewable fuel? That's, that's what they're you know, uh, claiming it is. And, and to some degree, they, well, they claim the renewable um, they don't. Not always are are they complaining that are claiming that it is uh, that it is renewable. But to some degree, there is an argument sometimes that you can recycle the spent fuel, um, and it is possible to do that. It, it's called reprocessing. It used to be called reprocessing. They now refer to it as recycling. I think to make it sound more green. All right. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, what that involves is taking this ex incredibly hot fuel that we've talked about and then running it through some sort of a plant, industrial plant, to strip out the plutonium and then reuse that plutonium in reactor fuel mm -hmm. and so therefore create a cycle for that. Unfortunately, we have a lot of experience with that. that that's how, essentially how we got the plutonium that we put into all of our warheads uh, in the U.S. arsenal. The Hanford waste that we're dealing with that's so difficult and, and to control and, and seems to be constantly breaking down and, and eluding our ability to contain properly is a result of that process. Mm -hmm. So this quote, recycling, end quote, doesn't really make the waste go away. It does reduce the length of time you have to store it because uh, plutonium is the most long-lived of the radionuclides that you'd be concerned about. but instead of you know, 100,000 years, you have to store it safely for maybe 10,000 years or something, which is a, you know, a monumental task uh, in and of itself. It, it, it is. Plus, you have all these waste streams that have solvents uh, that have been used to strip out the plutonium, which make it more handle, uh, difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, some radionuclides that are intensely hot and radioactive, and you have to protect your workers from them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and this is this is what happened. You know, the problems they've had there at Hanford were the same ones they had with. We had a commercial reactor program in uh, West Valley in New York that was a, a financial disaster. That is still a, a major cleanup site. Um, the French and the English uh, have had have their own weapons complexes that also have these difficult to deal with waste streams. So it's not a panacea as mm -hmm. it's been presented. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when when they say small, you know, usually we think of these big towers and uh, and assorted other buildings next to a right. to a nuclear plant. And now we're talking about small. What what's the scale? Um, these reactors are smaller, um, and the way the new scale design is set up, uh, it would be um, 50 megawatt reactors and uh, group together uh, up to 12 in a large pool of water. Uh, the water would be below grade. It would be, the water level would be right at probably about the surface uh, of the earth, wherever the site is located. And then you have um, the uh, reactors suspended in it. 
and then the spent fuel pool would be a little chamber that would be off right next to it. So this would all be in one common large pool of water. Because it's underground, it would drain less rapidly, they, they believe, um, if you had somehow uh, the, the, the pool got cracked in some way, it would take longer than if it were above ground and were just pouring out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, each of these reactors has its own containment that uh, works by, uh, works without power basically using convection um, and, and just uh, the heat, um, uh, you know, thermodynamics of heat circulating the water around it. Mm -hmm. And um, they believe that because these reactors are smaller, if you did have a situation where you lost water and the water levels began to drop um, and you had meltdown inside these reactors, that it wouldn't actually get out of containment. It would stay inside the containment. Mm -hmm. That's the claim. That's the claim, right. Yeah. But um, they have, have they ever actually built one of these? And, yeah, none of these have been built. built. Okay, none of them have been built. So it's all theoretical. Yeah, because they're light water reactors, they can understand some basic things about how light water reactors behave, and they can make predictions that are, you know, fairly intelligent. But until you actually build one, uh, they won't know for sure. Mm -hmm. So the plan at this point, um, New Scale was purchased. They were having financial, huge financial problems. They actually this is the almost, company that yeah. is in Corvallis, Corvallis like, Oregon, okay. right? Mm -hmm. uh, they were having financial difficulty. Um, they almost went bankrupt. They had to cut two thirds of their workforce. But then Floor Corporation stepped in, which is a big Texas uh, engineering firm, bought them out and uh, rehired people. And then they were successful in getting a federal matching grant. Uh, U.S. Department of Energy has been encouraging new reactor designs now for, since the Bush administration, and that was continued in the Obama administration. Um, and uh, competition for small modular reactors was set up. Uh, they were the second uh, company that got matching money. The first company actually has stopped research because it's matching money. You have to put up half of the money yourself. And this was Babcock and Wilcox Corporation, yeah. mm -hmm. which was a nuclear is a nuclear weapon or nuclear power uh, company and a and a uh, nuclear engineering firm, and um, they just didn't want to keep putting money into it. They didn't see the commercial value of that. Mm -hmm. Floor has been more um, willing to to speculate on it, and so at this point, they're the only new reactor uh, design that is being under that is under consideration by. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And because Westinghouse Corporation, which built a large reactor system, uh, a large reactor called the AP-1000, has, has been working on constructing the first of these. Um, the first of the small reactors? No, no, no uh, I'm the, sorry. The, the, uh, I, I, of the AP-1000. AP-1000s. Okay. They've been building a larger reactor system, which at this point is on the verge of utterly failing. Um, they have build, been building four reactors in the south and uh, declared bankruptcy uh, a couple of months ago because they're behind schedule and way over budget, billions of dollars over budget. And uh, their parent company, which is the Toshiba company, is in danger of also going bankrupt and being delisted on the Tokyo stock market. Because of the failure, the apparent failure of the AP-1000, it, it really looks as though this new scale uh, floor um, small modular reactor is the last remaining hope of the nuclear power industry in the United States to start building in, uh, on a large scale a new reactor system. Okay, yeah. So talk about uh, this legislation that was in, that is in, uh, in the Oregon legislature, SB 990. Yeah, uh, we had sort of been thinking that at some point New Scale would want to change Oregon's law because right now it would be illegal to build a a new scale reactor system in Oregon. And that's because in 1980, the voters approved a ballot measure that requires that before any more nuclear plants are built in the state, that there be a permanent disposal site for the high level nuclear waste it generates. And also that there be a statewide vote of the people. Um, so um, there aren't really strong prospects right now for a small modular reactor to be built in Oregon and probably won't be until they prove that they can actually build one somewhere. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, but it's embarrassing for that company to be located in a state that, for which their product mm -hmm. is, would be illegal to build. And so we kind of thought they would do it, and, and, but we weren't looking very carefully this year, unfortunately. We'd been looking in past years, but at the end of the time period where uh, legislators can introduce new legislation, uh, Senator Brian Boquist introduced as a priority bill, uh, SB 990, which would uh, create exemptions for reactors smaller than 300 megawatts um, that uh, they wouldn't have to meet this waste disposal requirement, even if they're generating the same waste, which is kind of a weird thing, but they, mm -hmm. this, was, this was in the bill specifically. And then secondly, that local governments uh, at the state and county level could pass uh, legislation that would allow reactors to be built and then it would only require a local vote, not a statewide vote. Oh. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, this bill came through the Senate before environmentalists, uh, they, notably the Oregon Conservation Network, Oregon League of Conservation Voters, flagged it and said, hey, uh, this doesn't look that great, you know, is there anyone concerned about this? And mm -hmm. we found out about it and said, yeah, we're concerned. And, and it had already gone through the Senate. It so. had passed the Senate mm -hmm. overwhelmingly, 25 to 4. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because there had been no opposition to it. and Because nobody knew about it. Well, well, somebody had to have known it if it got all the way. To, it was but known. Not the critics. The critics, the main critics like ours, the more informed critics like myself or uh, Lloyd Marbet from the Oregon Conservancy Foundation were not alerted to it. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, Dan Meek, who's been a, a panelist, did speak in opposition to it, mm -hmm. and um, but there was not an organized uh, opposition to it. But as soon as we were told about it uh, via the Oregon Conservation Network, uh, both Lloyd's group and, and Physicians for Social Responsibility and a number of other groups swung into action. Uh, Oregon Sierra Club joined in. Uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, I think, was influential and really helpful in lobbying on that. And we were able to convince the committee not to schedule a work session for it. They had a courtesy hearing for Senator Boquist, mm -hmm. but we had a we we went around and and, and just on that day that that was was uh, being considered in the committee, uh, we went to every office and found that. Everyone in these offices knew that this bill existed, and they'd been getting contacted by their constituents. So it was oh, a very good oh, okay. response. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, so it is. It is dead for for at least this session. It appears so. Uh, the only thing that could revive it would be uh, some sort of chicanery in in one of the rules committees uh, in either the House or the Senate. But um, the word is that the governor is not interested in having this controversial thing appear on her desk, and, and uh, <laughs> right. so, so when she's going for real, yeah, right exactly, now. and and um, and it's premature anyway. I mean, one of our best arguments was, well, you know, let's wait and see if they can actually build one successfully before we change our state law. You know, mm -hmm. then then come back and we can have a discussion about mm -hmm. it. Uh, and the plan at this point is to get their licensing completed with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by uh, 2020, spring of 2020, and then have the first one construction start in Idaho at the Idaho National Laboratories to finish in, uh, in 2022 and finish in 2026. Mm -hmm. um, as of the end of last year, they were saying 2023, so their, their timeline has already slipped three years you know, in less than six, well, a little over six months uh -huh. at this point. Right. Um, but, um, you know, so, uh, and it's, there are a lot of questions as to whether or not this will actually happen, mainly because they're counting on a group of municipal utilities in Utah agreeing to sell the bonds for, for the construction of this reactor system, this untested reactor mm -hmm. system. And there's already some signs that some of these utilities are beginning to question whether it's a smart idea or not. Yeah, so they're starting to feel, <laughs> starting to feel the heat. <laughs> well, it's an expensive proposition, yeah. uh, and as we've just seen with the utilities that bought into Westinghouse in Georgia and South Carolina, you can lose billions of dollars on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And little towns, you know, I think the biggest town in, in uh, Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems is uh, Logan. You know, so it's not exactly a giant metropolis. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, and uh, 
we had a situation in, in the Northwest when during the, the, the heyday of nuclear power, yeah. uh, the Washington Public Power Supply System, where a bunch of small uh, public power utilities banded together to try to build five reactors mm -hmm. and, and uh, Whoops. Whoops. Right. Yeah. yeah. WPPSS. Yeah. And only four, four of them failed and one was completed and is still operating at Hanford. But, right. Yeah. Right. But it was a financial disaster yeah. for public power and about a third of Bonneville's rates are going to cover nuclear power and it's producing about 10% of its electricity okay. right now. All right. Well, we are, we're, we're going to have you on our next week and we'll talk some more about the Columbia Generating Station okay. in Hanford. And so I thank you very much for being on now. Yeah. And we'll see you again next week. Sounds great. Great. So we've been talking with Charles Johnson, director of the Joint uh, Task Force on Nuclear Power with the Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. On Populist Dialogues, we have previously discussed the National Popular Vote, a program which would require enacting states to cast their electoral college votes for the presidential candidate receiving the most popular votes nationally. This would be effective only when enough states representing a majority of the electoral college have all agreed to cast their votes the same way. Uh, interest in this program has peaked since the installation of Donald Trump as president by the electoral college in spite of having lost the popular vote by almost three million votes. In the Oregon legislature, H.R. 2927 has been approved by the Oregon House and is now in the Senate, uh, Oregon Senate Rules Committee. So far, so good. But one possible hang-up is that the Senate uh, Speaker, Senator Courtney, uh, has in the past blocked the national popular vote legislation from moving to a full vote. Help us move the vote along to passage. Please contact, her. Please contact Senator Courtney's office. Ask him to allow the vote to come to a full to the full Senate as written, without requiring that it be referred to the November uh, 2018 ballot. Senator Courtney's contact information is now on the screen. Please contact him as soon as possible and as often as you like. Also. Uh, just FYI, we save all our Populist Dialogues programs on our website, so visit www.populistdialogues.org to view past programs or, when viewing a program, to subscribe to our YouTube Populist Dialogues channel to receive, receive notifications of new programs. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.